Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for staying even after you got your beer and your food. I know that that is a great sacrifice. So I'll hope to not waste your time. Uh, the, go the goal here tonight is to sort of tell you a little bit about what Elasticsearch is and, and primarily how it works so that in the future you can make your own decision whether it is actually good thing for you or whether you will just leave it, you know, it's yet another hype buzzword that nobody really ever uses, everybody just talks about it. Uh, so, uh, as has been said, I actually work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch, so obvious disclaimers apply. Uh, I'm not paid to be here, uh, but close. Uh, so what is actually Elasticsearch? So the official definition, which I'm pretty sure you won't be able to read, no. So it is distributed. That's the first word of the definition. So uh, it was built from the beginning to be a cluster-first solution. Even if you just start your own one Elasticsearch node on your, on your machine, whether it's your Raspberry Pi or your, or your mainframe server, uh, it will sort of present itself as a cluster, as a cluster of one node. And then as you add more node, then the actual name of cluster will start making sense. Uh, but uh, it is important to remember that the clustering was baked in. It's not some addition on top of it. It's not something that uh, you get the standalone and, and if you, if you pay, uh, pay us enough money, we will allow you to use multiple machines. This has been built into it. Uh, the second part, is RESTful. So we use REST for everything, or to be more precise, we use HTTP and JSON for everything, because technically REST has many different definitions, and I'm sure we, we follow none of them. But we still use HTTP and JSON, and also we try to stick to the principle that anything that you could do through the API, you can. So you don't have to fiddle with config files or anything like that. There is not a single line of XML anywhere in sight. And that is even when Elasticsearch is actually written in Java. That impressed me immensely when I, when I first saw Elasticsearch. I was like, How it, what? Java people are allowed to not use XML? Interesting. Uh, so the next word in the definition is search. Uh, and that's, that's where we began. Uh, that was the first use case of Elasticsearch. Uh, the, the name kind of gives it away, but uh, it still bears to be said again that full text search was our bread and butter at the beginning, and sort of the rest grew out of it as we discovered that people started using it for things that we haven't foreso uh, foreseen. Uh, but to this day, it is still used as a, as a full text uh, search engine. If you've ever used a website like Stack Overflow or GitHub or something like that, and their search that's all powered by, powered by Elasticsearch. The next word is an analytics. So yeah, we do analytics. That's kind of why we're, uh, why we're here, because it's not just full text search engine anymore, but we also do some analytics, which typically means some aggregations or some interesting view of the data, how we can slice it and dice it and give you some, uh, something more than just you know, a subset of your data when you ask nicely. Uh, so together, the entire definition, trust me, this would have been so much more impressive if you could read the text. It's, it's distributed, restful, search and analytics engine. There's one more thing that didn't quite fit into it, and that is it is open source. Uh, it is so open source that even the parts that we charge money for are on GitHub, publicly available. Of course, you still need to pay us money for it, but you can you know, read the code and be inspired and, and decide whether that's, that's money well spent or whether you, you might want to do a better job yourself. So everything that I'll be, I'll be talking about is open source. I'm not here to sell you, to sell you anything. I mean, I could. Uh, if, you, if you wanted to talk to me later, we can you know, go half these on the, on the commission. Nah, uh, everything, is, everything is open source here. So uh, let's, start, let's start from the beginning. Just like Elasticsearch started, let's start with search. So what is search? What, is, what do you think is the most used search, especially by, by developers? Any guess? 
Uh, what was that? Grok file. Okay. So typically it's grep. Just literally look look through the files. And how does grep work if you think about it? It literally reads all your documents, all your text, and, and shows you where, where it matches. That's not really a good solution. Imagine that, that you had a library at home. I know it's a stretch, but try. And somebody asks you to point out the books about Python. And you would have to go read all of your books to, to be able to respond to that question. That is the equivalent of what Greb does. That is the equivalent of what if you do, if you use something like I like in a, in a select statement, uh, what that does. So surely there must be a better solution. So now comes my favorite question of, of the talk. Has anybody of you ever read a book? Who here has read a book at least once? Okay, one. nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, one is enough, one is enough. That still counts. So probably when you, if you read, ever read a book, you saw something like this. Hopefully it was a fancy book, because those, those have that. So this is an index. This is actually where the word index originally came from, uh, an index, index in a book. And this is a fairly old data structure, if we might call it so. It was invented in the early 1200s. At that time, everything was invented by monks, and so was this. They, they used something like this to try and make sense of the Bible. I will not comment on the outcome. But the data structure survived to this day, and this is still very much uh, the foundation of any full text search engine that you will ever find. And there are several key things that, that are happening in that picture. You have a list of words, and for each word, you have a list of pages where that word occurs. And more importantly, the list of words is sorted so that you can easily find the word that you're looking for. And the list of pages is sorted as well. So if I gave you a book with two of these at the back, one for places and one for people, would you be able to find me a page that has person A and place X? Probably, you just locate person A, you locate pers uh, uh, location X, and you manually walk the list of uh, page numbers, sorry, from your, from your uh, view it's this way. And uh, if you find the same number, that's your outcome. And that's literally all that we do under the hood. That's literally how all full text searching ever works. And there are some, some fascinating things about it. Uh, so to, be able to fully understand this. Let's implement uh, this data structure ourselves. Uh, this data structure is called an inverted index because it is a little bit upside down. We're not pointing from pages or documents to, to values, but from values and only partial values at that, from individual words back to the, back to the documents, back to the pages. So, of course, our weapon of choice today is gonna be Python. So we're, we're gonna create an index class that we want to index uh, text and be able to search it. So what do we need to do first? We need to create a data structure. Well, ideally we would have a sorted lists and sorted lists, et, et cetera. That's too much work and it doesn't fit on a slide very well. So it's Python, we're gonna use something more high level. We're gonna use dictionaries and sets. So we'll have a dictionary of, of words Coincidentally, that's also what the list of words is called in a proper inverted index that was not written on a slide at 8 p.m. And then, uh, instead, of a, instead of a sorted list, we will have a set. Because sets in Python are super easy to run intersections and unions and all of, all of those things that we would otherwise have to do, uh, have to do manual. So this is, this is how we, this is how we uh, define it, just a default dict to set. Uh, now, the first thing that we need to do when we get some text, let's say we index a document with an ID that has some text, we need to analyze it. That's a super fancy word for essentially splitting it into words. That's it. The goal of the analysis is 
uh, to normalize the text. And we'll see why it's important later on. So this will just yield all of the, all of the tokens from, from a text. Uh, then we can finally put those words into the index. So literally what we do is we locate the particular set and we add the document ID into it. That's it, that's all we need. Uh, and finally we have, our, we have our search method. And there's one important thing here, and that is we also use the analyze method on the query itself. Because as I, as I mentioned, the analyze is there to normalize the text. The idea there is uh, you will not always search exactly for what's in, what's in the book. You know, there are some technical, technicalities like uppercase and lowercase. Uh, there, are some, there are some weirdness with different languages that have you know, different endings and, and can have different morphological forms based on how they're being used. But we know that running and run is really the same word, right? So all we have to do is normalize it somehow so that in, into the inverted index, we always put, no matter what the input, we'll always put the same thing. So whether we get running, runs, run, ran, we'll always just put run into the inverted index. And then when we do the same to the query, then it's easy. We're just literally doing an exact match. So we can use our dictionary just fine. And then all that we have to do is just get all of our sets that we got for each one of the words of the query and just do an intersection. That's for the, uh, uh, for the operator and. If you want to do an operator or, we just do a union. Fairly, fairly straightforward stuff. The thing to remember here is that the core of the functionality, all of the magic, all of the part that makes it a full text search as opposed to just filtering is the analysis. The process of normalizing text into tokens no matter what their original form was. And there are many tools at our disposal. In, in our case, I just use a regular expression and, and lowercase everything. But I could easily try and uh, uh, do some stemming, find the stem of the word go from running to run. For English, it's quite easy. For other languages, not so much. Uh, but it is a well-defined process that you can all imagine how you would go about. From the completely brute force, let's throw a dictionary at it, which is actually a valid approach, because you only uh, do it once for the, uh, when you index, and then you only do it for the query, which is typically super short, so you can afford to do something a little bit more expensive. Uh, or you can get fancy with NLP and, and all kinds of things that, that I don't really know anything about. But again, the core is, is in the analysis. And then there, there will come a next step, which we completely, completely omitted, and that is Elasticsearch will not only tell you which of your documents matched your query, but also how well did they match your query. That's the important part. I want, it, uh, I want the results back so that the most relevant ones are at the top. So in our example, imagine that if we, instead of a set, used a counter. So for each document, we will have not only the information whether it matched uh, the word, whether it contains the token in its normalized form, but also how many times. Because if, if uh, a book contains the word Python all over, then it's probably a better match than something that just mentions Python once, right? Imagine that we also then kept track of how frequent a word is on its own. How many books are there that actually mention Python? Those two, th those two things together, how many times did I find it and how rare a word it is, uh, are the foundations of calculating something like a relevancy score. In fancy terms, we can call one TF, term frequency, and the, and the second one, IDF, inverse document frequency. And we get TF-IDF, the scoring function to determine that. Unfortunately, it doesn't make for a pretty slide, so no scoring for you today. Uh, so that's how, that's how full text search works. Now, Elasticsearch adds some stuff on top of it. The first thing, as promised, 
is that Elasticsearch is distributed. When you create an index in Elasticsearch, it will automatically be split into different parts. Uh, some systems call it partitions, we call them shards. And those shards will be distributed all over your cluster. Uh, the shards can also uh, have a replica, so you can have two copies of each shard in case something goes wrong and in case you need some additional throughput by utilizing more nodes. So how would that look, again, in Python? So if we rename the class that we just created into shard, we can create another class on top of it that will represent this, uh, this sort of distributed index. So in, in the init, we just literally say, hey, let's split this one into five shards. So we create five shard objects. Very straightforward. If we do indexing, all we have to do is for every single document that we want to index, locate the shard that it's supposed to go simply by hashing the ID. That will give us the shard, and then we already have the index method, so we're done there. So how would search look then? Well, search, we don't go to just one shard. We, can't, we don't have an ID to hash or something like that. So we just broadcast the search to all of the shards. And then we get back the individual responses, and then we union them together. Now, doesn't this look familiar? It looks pretty similar to the code that we had before for just that one, uh, for just that one index, because the principles are roughly the same. Sure, instead of an intersection, we now have a union. But ultimately, this is, again, just merging partial results, where before we had a partial result for each word of the query. You could easily imagine how it would work if I had an index per field. I could get a partial uh, response for each field, one for location, one for a person. And the code would still look the same. So this is the idealized version how the inverted index works and how searching in Elasticsearch works. And you can notice several things. First of all, we can use all of the indices that we, that we have. We are not limited like other systems uh, that we have to choose one index per table per query, which is a typical limitation of like uh, a SQL database. Uh, you can also see, because of how the merging happens, well, in our case, it's sets. That's not really that great. But if you can easily imagine how you would, how you would merge together multiple sorted lists. If you were a, a, a tiny, little bit, uh, tiny little bit smart, uh, which I assume that you are because you're here, then you would even implement the list in a, in a way that would, be, uh, uh, that would make it easier to do this merging. So you would implement them as something like skip lists or something like that. And then you realize that the more of those lists that you have, the faster you can actually iterate through it, the faster you can eliminate most of the, most of the hits. So the more filters you have, the more conditions you have against your data, the faster your, your queries will be. Now that's interesting. Also what you, know, what you can notice is that the size of the index actually scales with the values, not with the documents. The documents are just sorted lists somewhere. That's, that's easy to do. So how far has our id, uh, idealized version been from the reality? So the reality is slightly more complicated. So I know that around here this probably doesn't work that much, but you know you can appreciate the effort that went into the joke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in reality, it, it works similarly as, as, as we described. Um, not too long ago, like two, two versions of uh, Lucene back, literally the dictionary was, uh, was just a sorted list and we, we looked up terms by doing a binary search. Data structures 101, doesn't have to be more complex than that. Uh, right now, we, we went a little fancy, it went into our heads, and now it's no longer a sorted list. It's an FSD and finite state reducer, which, which has much better capabilities, and we can do fuzzy searches as well, and much cheaper, and all of that stuff, and it's fancy, and nobody really knows how it works, but uh, we have some tests, so we're good. Uh, we also implemented other data structures. Uh, uh, two versions ago, we indexed numbers as text, we literally took the, the text representation of a number, we stuffed it into an inverted index because that was all that we had, and it worked. 
It was okay. It wasn't great, but it worked. Uh, now we have, we have BKD trees, which is a special version of a k-dimensional uh, binary tree. No, B tree, sorry, not binary tree, B tree. Uh, I had to memorize that, I have no idea what that means. So that's why I always mess it up. Uh, and we use that for, for all our numerical values. We also use it for all the multidimensional values that we might have, you know, for example, IPv6, uh, or, or any of the geo, uh, geo data that you might want to store. Uh, actually, the current version that is uh, out there will still index a geo shape as just a list of, list of hashes, as a list of strings. Only the one that's coming soon, let's hope, uh, will finally have the geo shapes also indexed in the BKD tree as an, as an array of four dimensional numbers because somebody figured out how to encode a triangle with four numbers. So, so we were not that far, far off. Our mental model of the inverted index is pretty spot on. But I also promised you analytics. So where do they come in? And where do they come from? Well, this is where they come from. It's an interface called a faceted search. And if you've ever used a search, you probably saw something like that, where you have your results in the middle, but on the side, you have your summaries, your categories. If you search on GitHub, you will see uh, that you, you found 10 repositories in Ruby and, and 25 in, in Python. That's called faceted search. And that was always part of an, a proper interface for a full text search. And we took it and we ran with it until we ran into a, well, into a dashboard. So this is also using Elasticsearch. This is, this, is, uh, this is Kibana, the JavaScript front end to visualize data. And what it's using to actually compute all of these pretty pictures is, is aggregations, which is a feature of Elasticsearch that allows you to, to slice and dice uh, your data. So how do they work? Let's first uh, see, how they, uh, see how they work, and then we'll see some examples. Uh, so inverted index is great, uh, but it is absolutely useless when it comes to aggregations. Because if you think about it, if I give you a book and tell, uh, and, uh, or just the index of a book, and I ask you, what are the words on page 42? Well, that sucks. You'll have to read the entire index. Uh, so that's no good, because that's exactly the task that you need to do when you're doing aggregations, to look up over and over what's the value for this document and for this document and for this document, so that you can actually combine these values together and do something smart with them. So our first attempt was sort of, uh, what can we do just now? And the result was field data. We literally uninverted the inverted index, and we, it's literally an uninverted inverted index. I don't know why we don't call it just index, uh, but I guess we already use it for too many things anyways. So uh, this is an uninverted inverted index. And what it is, it's an in-memory uh, bag of data where we store for each document a value for a certain field. We store them all together. Uh, then, you know, people started calling us that, you know, their, their clusters are running out of memory. <laughs> so we decided to, to get a little better. Uh, so uh, we implemented doc values, uh, which is just pretty much a synonym to field data when you think about it. But uh, the difference is that doc values, at least for us, means that this is stored on disk. So we computed at... Uh, at index time, and we store for each field, we have, we have a bag on, on disk that contains a value for each, uh, for each document. And this is not, again, something that, that we invented. Uh, we are smart, but we're not that smart. Uh, so this is, just a, this is just a column store. This is the same approach that any analytic database that, that you ever heard of probably uses anyways, because it works. Because, it's, because it has some nice properties when you try to read it, and especially when you try to read it sequentially, which we do. Because imagine us merging our lists, that's 90% of what we do. Uh, and then every time we find a document, we go and retrieve the value from, uh, from disk to update our, our aggregation. And because the lists are sorted, 
That means that we will access the documents in order. So if we access the first value from, from a column store, it's, uh, disks are lazy. They don't want to do repetitive work. So they will not return uh, into memory just one value. They will just load an entire page. So the chances are the next document that we need, because we are accessing them in sequence, will already be in that page loaded into memory. So when we access it, it will be much, much faster. So that's nice, and it works. OK, so I see that you're already a little bored. And uh, theory is, is one thing, but how does this actually work? How would you actually, how would you actually use it? And since we're in, in PyData, and, and because I don't know any other language, uh, we'll see how this works in Python. So my, my favorite data set to play around with is my Git history. Uh, not related to any, any discussion that we've, that we've just had about uh, how a proper uh, Git history should look like. Uh, so imagine that we have documents like this. And by the way, this is, this is important that this is a perfectly valid document for Elasticsearch. Even though it's not flat, it contains lists of things. Uh, this one in particular doesn't contain lists of objects, but it could. Anything that you can express as JSON is a valid document in Elasticsearch. And we, we shove this into, into Elasticsearch. Now, contrary to some, some things that you might find online, Elasticsearch is not a schemaless database. Uh, it's not schemaless because it requires a schema and it enforces a schema. However, if you don't give it a schema, it will just make one up. Uh, and then it will insist on it, and then it will enforce it. So typically, you want to, you want to preempt that and, and just create your own schema. So uh, we have these documents, and we have a, a, a small function that produces those documents uh, using, uh, using uh, I think it's Python git, the library, uh, with capital P and capital G, because of course that's how we name libraries in Python. Uh, and it allows this functionality where we can traverse uh, the history, and all we need to do is yield them out. So this is a generator that will generate our documents. Uh, now we need to load them all into, into Elasticsearch. So all we have to do is, is uh, find a helper. In this case, it's called, it's called Bulk, because Bulk is the API to load, load things into Elasticsearch one by one. Thank you, thank you. Somebody is listening. That's always my, my test. And, uh, and this, this, is all that, this is all that we need. Uh, by the way, this code is all part of the official Python client. In the example repository, you can actually see, see all of this. Uh, maybe you can even run it. I haven't tested it in quite a while. So now we have all of our data in Elasticsearch. It took a generator and a, and a bulk helper, and, and we're good. So now we can do a query for that. We'll use another library, Elasticsearch DSL, uh, written by yours truly. And that's the idea there is it's kind of like an ORME thingy for, for Elasticsearch. So you don't have to write JSON in Python because that's painful. Uh, even if you just have to write it as Python Dix and not really as JSON, it's still painful. You feel like you're writing Lisp. Like to, to just keep track of the opening and closing curly braces, it's, it's not nice. So we have something like this. So we create a search, we search over an index, and then we, then we create a query. We create a match query. I won't go into many details what the query being match actually means. Uh, unfortunately, if you need, want to use this library or if you want to use Elasticsearch, you should really read some documentation and, and know the different types of queries, et cetera. Uh, uh, but there is, a, there is a match query which looks for words and does all of the uh, clever full texty thingy that we, that we talked about. Uh, then we can do another uh, part of the query. So we are still just composing one, uh, one search request that we'll then send uh, later. So in this case, we're excluding, and it's a term query, where we want the files to match the, uh, the, uh, the directory test underscore Elasticsearch. And we also add uh, the aggregation, where we are looking for the top 10 authors. So we are, we are querying our Git history where the description has the word fix in it, but it doesn't uh, touch the test directory. 
then all we need is some code to, to output our results. Uh, we are just looking at the, at the aggregations. So we're looking for the top one author that, that created commits, that claimed that they have fixed something, but didn't actually prove it because there, is, there are no tests. So we can skip over the next part because this is the actual result of that query, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, you, can see, you can see what we, what we did there. We threw in a bunch of queries, we threw in an aggregation, and we got something that's potentially useful. I mean, people could get fired over this. I hope not, but it may be in some companies. So this is, this is a simple query. Now we can go a little bit more, a little bit more complex, and, and because this is about data, so let's do something more analytical. Uh, so we start with our search, but this time we do the Python slicing thing. So we are saying that we don't want any hits back. We don't care about individual documents. We'll only do aggregations here. Uh, and that allows some internal optimizations in Elasticsearch, et cetera. Uh, nothing too special. And then we define an aggregation. We actually define two aggregations in this call. One is called monthly, and it's a data histogram over the, over the field uh, committed date. And the interval that it uses is, well, months. So we are splitting our data by month. Then within that, we create another uh, aggregation called file stutched, which is a cardinality aggregation over the field files, essentially getting us the number of unique values uh, for that field that, that are present for each month. So for each month, we have the number of files, number of unique files that were, that were touched. But we can keep going. We can add another aggregation inside, inside the month. Let's, for each month, get the top authors, the, the authors of commits that authored the most commits, just looking at the raw number of documents. And uh, because we still have some room on the slide, we can also fit in another aggregation looking for the best authors. Uh, the way that you qualify a best author is they deleted the most code. I think that's a pretty good metric for, for the best commit author. So we do that by, again, defining two aggregations. Uh, we we uh, group things by author. E for, and for each one of them, we calculate the sum of the deleted lines. And then we, we go back and we sort the authors by that, uh, by that metric. So overall, what we're doing, what this query is doing, is for each, uh, for each month, it gives us the number of unique files touched and the top 10, uh, top 10 most productive authors for that month, and then also gives us the overall top 10 authors uh, based on their productivity, based on how fast they can delete code. And this will all happen in a, in a single query if we execute this. So to me, that's pretty cool because we can do all, of that in, do, do all of this in a single request, so I don't have to uh, run multiple requests, and also Elasticsearch will just do one pass over the data and calculate all of these aggregations at once. So when we put sort of everything that, that, we've, that we've learned, hopefully, uh, together. So we have one thing that I, that I didn't really mention, but they're kind of obvious, because I said that Elasticsearch will tell you how well something matched, not just whether it matched. But, you know, sometimes you just don't care. If you're, especially if you're only interested in the aggregations, you don't really care whether you're aggregating over good documents or meh documents. You have to aggregate all, over all of them. So just by specifying filters instead of queries, which is a technicality, but important one, it will get, it will get much, much smarter and much faster. Uh, in, the same, in the same sort of vein is to set the size to zero when you're only interested in aggregations. Uh, then, the important thing is you can mix and match everything. Uh, you can nest the aggregations as we have seen. You can use multiple queries and multiple filters at the same, at the same time. I can tell you now, a little spoiler, uh, that uh, if you use many, many filters, they will each be, each be cached individually, and then we'll be able to reuse those caches as we, as we go through them. 
also because of the property of merging sorted lists. I know I talk about that a lot. I promise this is probably the last mention of that. Um, the more filters you have, the more queries you have, the, the faster we can eliminate things and, and the faster we'll go through. In fact, most of the time, Elasticsearch scales, uh, the, the time of the response scales with the number of items returned or number of items processed. So not the overall data set, but actually the data set that you match. So if you have a, if you have a ginormous data set, billions and billions of documents and trillions of documents, uh, but you have a very restrictive search that only matches 10,000, that will most likely be super fast, assuming that you know you have the hardware that can hold a trillion documents. But it is possible. And uh, yeah, more, more is less. So the more that you query, the faster it will be, the more, the more indices it will, it will use under the hood, et cetera. Uh, and finally, if Elasticsearch is not enough for you, which I very much doubt, uh, but no, no, really, there are many, many things that we will never do, uh, we'll never even try to do, and especially in the, in the Python world, it, it wouldn't even be, uh, you know, it wouldn't even make sense for us to try and do. That is, if you want any more, more advanced analytics or something like that, something that, that everybody here uh, knows more about than me, probably, uh, there is a special API called scan, which you can use to export the data, export the results of your query, get all of it back, no matter whether it's, whether it's 10 documents or 10 billion. It will just stream it out of Elasticsearch. You can load it into IPython notebook and, and finally do something useful with the data. You know, not just you know, fancy aggregation and seeing who lies in their comment messages. Uh, so that's always, that's always an option and, and actually together with all of the, uh, the Python sort of uh, uh, data ecosystem, this is one that we see very often and, and uh, we're seeing it more and more every day. So uh, finally, some, some boring stuff. So how do you even get data into Elasticsearch, et cetera? Uh, well, there is, there is the obvious answer. Uh, just use Python, it works very well. Uh, there, is a, there is a bunch of helpers like the bulk, et cetera, that will allow you to do it in, in a very small amount of code. And because it just works with, with JSON objects, which you can represent as Python dictionaries, uh, this, is, this is very easy to do. Uh, we also have a, a, set of, a set of agents called beats if you want to collect any, any, technical, uh, any technical operational data. Uh, your metrics from your, from your infrastructure, some, some log files, uh, uh, some, some other things, uh, packets, from your, packets from your network, uh, et cetera. So for every type of, of data like that, we do, have, we do have a beat that will automatically start collecting the data and shipping them into, into Elasticsearch. For example, we have a packet beat which will literally sit there on the network and just observe the packets as they go by and it will just inspect them, and because it understands different protocols, it will tell you, oh, yeah, that, that was an HTTP request, and the response was 200, and it took this long to execute. And that was a, that was a select statement for, for MySQL, and it was reading from that table, and it took five milliseconds to execute. And then it will, and then it will preload a pretty, pretty dashboard for you in Kibana, so that you can you know, project them on the wall and, and enjoy the pictures that your database makes. If that's not enough for you, there is, there is Logstash, which is pretty much take data from anywhere and, and, and put them anywhere else. Uh, nothing much to be said that. It's a sort of a generic processing pipeline that, was, that mostly worked with Elasticsearch, but it has many, many other outputs and uh, even, more, even more inputs. Uh, now, what are some of the, some of the highlights of the, of the architectural decisions that you can, that you can use with, with Elasticsearch? So first uh, uh, thing that's interesting is using multiple indices. So you might, have, you might have noticed in the code that I showed for the distributed index that uses the shards that the response from the shard is not specific to that index. It is just the, the set of documents or something like that. And from that we can make the short leap to it doesn't really matter whether the shards that we search belong to the same index or different indices. There's literally no difference 
down to the code path that, that the code will execute, uh, between searching uh, 10 indices with one shard each, or one index with 10 shards. It's literally the same operation, and that gives you some freedom into how you structure your data and how you utilize uh, the, the Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, you can also, when it comes to the cluster, you can mix and match different types of nodes. You can have a fast, expensive hardware with SSDs, et cetera, to index the new data as they come in, because that's an expensive operation. We, we sort of delegate a lot of the cost uh, for performance to the indexing process, so we don't have to pay it at search time. So you can, you can have powerful machines for that, and then have, then have five ginormous machines with, with large spinning disks that are very cheap that will store data from last week that nobody ever asks about, except you know this one guy. There's always this one guy. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's an option that, that will allow you to sort of optimize the, the, use, of the use of the hardware. And uh, finally, I, I have to mention this because it's another Python tool that we have. It's called Curator. And it's there to manage the indices that you have in Elasticsearch, primarily to delete them. Uh, to delete the old ones that, that nobody cares except that one person. Uh, but you know they're not paying your hardware budget, so Curator. So uh, finally, you know, is it web scale? Uh, yes, yes it is. Next question. Uh, we, uh, because it is distributed by, by default and because of the way it works, it can scale up to, to a lot of data. Uh, and it works quite well. It doesn't work for free. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. It will eat a lot of hardware. It will eat a lot of memory. Uh, it will eat everything that you give it and then, then ask for seconds but it will actually do the work. So no matter what the payload, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that, that you can scale up to it. It might not be economical, but it is, it is possible. And many people believe that it is even economical to just, to just feed, it, feed it enough hardware uh, and be done with it. So thank you so much for listening to me, even though there, were, there was probably still some beer outside. I really appreciate it. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to try and answer them. So any, any live questions? I can see there are not. Uh, I will ask the questions from Slido. So first one is, uh, how does Elasticsearch compare to Solar? Or yep. I don't know this technology. So Solar is another um, open source uh, full text search engine that's also based on Lucene. So we share, we share the engine. The, the relationship between Elasticsearch and Lucene, you can imagine it like, like MySQL and InnoDB. Very, very tight coupling. We provide a lot of functionality on top of it because after all, Lucene is a library and Elasticsearch is a distributed data store. So uh, Solar is something similar. To me, the biggest difference between those two is Elasticsearch is younger and it's, and it's showing. It was des designed from the beginning to be distributed and to be friendly to developers. Uh, Solar, it's kind of showing its age where uh, it does do the clustering as well, uh, but you need to install Zookeeper first, uh, then, then, then plug it in, then write some XMLs, and then, and then you will have a Solar cluster. It is still, it is still very, very capable, but uh, the ultimate answer that I always give is take five minutes. Spend five minutes with Elasticsearch and see if you can get Solar up and running in five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the que second question is, uh, is there some Elastic package for Julia? Or if you want to use it, do you have to write your JSONs and? You have to write your JSONs and HTTP. That's the nice part. It's just HTTP. It's not like some binary protocol or something like that. And there are only a few rules that you have to that you have to follow, like uh, try and not talk to just one node, and but spread uh, spread your requests across either by using a load balancer or by d directly doing the load balancing in your application, etc. But ultimately, it's just it's just HTTP and JSON. So unfortunately, no, there is there is no Julia client as of now. We do have. Uh, we do have a Perl client. Does that help? I don't know. Probably not, but we do have one. Okay. Any other questions? Are there any 
Any other questions? Beer. <laughs>